can go. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are continuing with chapter four, which is the chapter on transient heat conduction. We haven't even started with paragraph 4.1 yet. Okay. So if you look at that, at the whole chapter and you page through it, you're going to see 4.1 is a small section, relatively easy, and then things really become very complicated. But it is very, very important that we spend a lot of time on this part because specifically 4.1, the part that we're going to do now, is the one that confuses students more than any other. Okay. So up to the end of the course, students would still come and see me and ask me, please explain to me again, because I still do not understand. But it is very, very simple. So I'm still going to spend time on, even before we start with, with, with a paragraph 4.1, just to make sure that, you're, that everything is in place and, uh, and that you really understand where we are going to, going to and what we are doing. Okay. So yesterday we've looked at a revision of a little bit of fluid mechanics and the equations that we have available to solve engineering problems with. And we've said it is the integral types of equation, which in general you've used right through your fluid mechanics course. And then there's the differential approach. The differential approach is the small detail. You're going to divide it up into small control volumes and you would like to know uh, if you want to design something in the design, many, many different points, you would like to know what are the temperatures or the velocities. Then you use the differential approach, and that is what you're going to use now in your computational fluid dynamics scores. If you're not interested in that and you want the average values, you go for the integral approach, as you've done in fluid mechanics. Right. So, but in any case, the result of the differential approach of the energy equation is this equation. You can see it is in three dimensions, the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. And on the inside of the control volume, this is the heat that is being generated on the inside, and that might be an electrical resistance element, it might be a chemical reaction, or a nuclear reaction that generates that heat for us, or absorbs the heat, does it matter? And this is obviously the mass of the control volume and how it changes as a function of time. So we are specifically interested in how things change as a function of time because that is what transient mean, how things change as a function of time. So for any body, we are interested in the temperature. and It can be a three-dimensional body as a function of time. So now that we know what we want to do, what are our options? Our options if we want to solve this equation is firstly to say, well, we would like an analytical equation. That's the first option. Okay. As I've mentioned yesterday, nobody so far can give us that analytical solution, unfortunately. Okay. So in the meantime, what do we do? We make things simpler. We try to make it as simple as we can. If we make it as simple as we can, we start by throwing this away, that away, that away, and that away, and we end up with a one-dimensional equation, which is Fourier's law, which is the transfer rate is equal to K multiplied by the TDX. So, so that is what we end up. Then when we can do that, we try to go and look at other possibilities also, maybe including that, maybe doing it in two dimensions, and then start building up to three dimensions, etc. So in all of this, we make many assumptions. Okay. Some of the assumptions that really makes things very, very easy for us is this one here, the thermal conductivity. If the thermal conductivity in the body is a constant, it really makes things much easier because then we can take this out as a constant. Okay. So that is the first assumption that we normally make. And fortunately for us, in many, many bodies, it is relatively constant. It is a function of temperature, but typically for most engineering problems, it is a good assumption to say the thermal conductivity is a constant. Okay. Then, as I've said, we are going to look at one dimensions and then 
after that 2D and 3D and obviously we also want to bring in time and to see how things change. So this is the approach that has been used in history and chapter 4 is a very very short summary of some of the most important developments in this regard. It's not everything because if it is everything then it would be a chapter this thick. Okay. And you don't need that because you at this stage you just want to know the principles. Right. So, if we want to solve a body like that, that is our first possibility we can do that. The second one is CFD, computational fluid dynamics or FEM, which means it is just numerically that you're going to solve it. You're going to discrete or you're going to develop a grid or control volumes and then you're going to integrate all the equations over that and you're going to develop discretized equations. In many cases, unfortunately, it is not so easy to solve. If it's a solid body, then it is very stable in the solution. You can do it with many different methods, um, also finite elements, but unfortunately, if you would remember yesterday, there was the viscosity terms also in the momentum equation. And that really makes the whole thing very non-linear, which is very different than with structural problems. And solving uh, fluid flow problems took many, many more years before it could, could be done than finite elements. So it is more complicated, but it can be done. So that is the second approach. And the third one would obviously be go and do experiments and go and do measurements. So those are the three possibilities. Right, now before we continue, I also want to do a little bit of more revision and there's a specific reason for that and you're going to see the reason just now, a little bit later. I want to go back to also in this textbook of Sengel and Gijar in chapters 2 and 3. Okay, where you have looked at the concept of thermal resistance. Okay. The concept of thermal resistance. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from electricity theory. So, you know that if you've got a resistance and you would like to determine the current through it, and if that element has a certain resistance and that is delta V, the potential difference, then the current through it would be equal to delta V divided by R. You remember? Now with heat transfer problems we can use exactly the same approach. So if for example we've got a body which might be copper and on the copper we've got some insulation material insulation and here on the outside we've got a heat transfer coefficient and that is the temperature T environment and that is the temperature T1 okay. then we can say that this is, the copper will have a certain resistance. Okay. The insulation material will also have a certain resistance. And the heat transfer through the air will also have a resistance. So if that is the temperature T environment and that is the temperature T1, and this is the resistance R1 and R2 and R3. Then we can use exactly the same approach. We can say that the heat transfer rate okay, is equal to the temperature difference over the body divided by the total resistance. The temperature difference would be equal to T1 
minus the environment divided by the sum of the resistances. You remember that? A very, very simple concept, exactly the same as in electricity, the flow of current through a resistance element. Now, although this is a very simple problem, we can also maybe look at radiation heat transfer. Okay. Then it means that we have to go and put this current together so that maybe we've got the first resistance element, the second one and the third one, and now from there we have one for convection and the resistance to radiation. And as you know, when you've got two resistance elements in parallel, you can reduce that to one resistance. Those two resistances can also be reduced into one. And at the end, you end up with the same type of network. Okay, you remember that. Very, very simple and logical concept. Now, in terms of just looking at typical values, for conduction heat transfer. So for conduction heat transfer, there were different cases that you've considered in the previous chapters. The first one was the one of the plain wall. Okay. The plain wall is just very sim simply an element like that. Okay, plain wall. And for the plane wall, the resistance of conduction is equal to L divided by Ka. Okay. Just go to your textbook again and you can go and revise it quickly. It's very, very simple. Okay. Then, for a cylinder, if you have a cylinder, uh, and that is equal to the radius on the outside, and that is the radius on the inside. Okay, so this is for a cylinder. Then the conduction resistance is equal to the lin of R outside divided by R inside divided by 2 pi LK. Where L is the length of the cylinder. Uh, so my sketch is not so good. Uh, let me see if I can do it in this direction. So that would be the length of the cylinder. Okay, you remember that? Okay. Then, for a sphere, the same can be done. And then the resistance would be equal to R outside minus R inside divided by 4 pi R outside R inside divided by K. So those were the three different elements. Okay. Now there are other bodies also, more complex, which obviously is more difficult to quantify in certain terms, but these three are the three most important conduction ones. Right. The convection one is the simplest of all of them. Okay. The resistance for convection is just simply one divided by the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area. And then the one for radiation the one the resistance for radiation is one divided by the radiation heat transfer coefficient <coughs> multiplied by the area. And you might think this is now strange because where's the Stier van Boltzmann uh, equation? But you can take that equation and you can simplify it so that you can put everything 
and I represent it into that heat transfer coefficient. And that value, if you're worried about it, looking like this, the heat transfer coefficient of radiation is equal to the emissivity multiplied by the Stefan Boltzmann constant, so now it's coming back, multiplied by the surface temperature squared plus the surrounding temperature squared multiplied by the surface plus the surroundings. Okay. You need to do a little bit of manipulation and that is available in your textbook. Just go and look at it quickly. Right, up to now I've, done, I've just I just did a little bit of preparation work in terms of the most important things that we're going to cover now. Right. So at last, let's start with paragraph 4.1, which is the lumped system. The lumped system approach. Now in terms of the textbook, if we look at the whole body of work in the textbook, if that now represents chapter 4, and this is paragraph 4.1, but it's not to scale. So this thing should actually be very, very small in terms of the body of the work in paragraph 4.1. Okay, so this is not to scale. So paragraph 4.1 is the lumped system approach. The one we're going to do now. Okay. Paragraph 4.1, or 4.2, is going to be long plane walls. Okay, so I'm not going to write it out. Long plane walls. So in terms of plane walls, you see there it is. <laughs> long plane walls. So we're going to start looking at plane wall but very long. Okay. For obvious reasons in terms of the assumptions of 1D or 2D. We want to make sure that we do not have problems with that. Okay. Then we are also going to do long cylinders. Again, cylinders but now long ones. Okay. And then also spheres. Unfortunately a sphere is a sphere and you can't make it longer and shorter. Okay. Okay. So paragraph 4.2 is about that. Then paragraph 4.3 is a semi-infinite solid. Semi-infinite solids. I'm not going to write that out. Semi-infinite solids. And then paragraph 4.4 is multidimensional. Okay, so now we're going to start making it 3D. All right. Now, the thing with this chapter is that, obviously, this part is the easiest. Okay. It is the simplest. <laughs> but students have the most problems with this part than any other part. And you have to take care that you really understand what we're going to do now and when you can use this approach, because that is the big question. I'm going to give you a problem in the test or exam and say, what is the temperature? And now you must decide which one to, to use. <laughs> and that is where students in many cases have problems. They find it very, very difficult to know when they can use this because it's so easy and simple in comparison with the rest. Okay. All right. So, and obviously in terms of complexity, things becomes more complex in this direction. You'll see if you look at the mathematics, and in many cases very irritating in terms of the equations to be used. They're not very nice to solve. Okay. Right, now let's look at lump systems or in general transient heat transfer. Okay, so transient heat transfer I would like to divide into two categories. Okay. So category one and category two problems. You'll see these are my, my own categories. There's not something like that in the textbook. Okay. So it's two categories of problems. 
In both of them, we are interested in a body. It can be a plane wall, a cylinder, a sphere, or something very complicated like your cell phone, or this venue that you are in, or a piece of steel that you throw into hot water, whatever. Okay. And with all of them, let's put in a few arbitrary points that we are interested in. So there's point one, there's point two, and there is point three. And we are interested in getting the temperature as function of time. This body, let's say it is 70 degrees Celsius. Everything at a uniform temperature. And with category two, problem's exactly the same. Let's just choose arbitrary three different measuring points. And we are interested to know what is the temperatures of points one, two, and three as a function of time. So that is the purpose of my category one problem and my category two problem. Okay. Now, if I take this body and at t equals zero, I would put it in a fluid maybe at a temperature of zero degrees Celsius. T equals zero. We put it in an environment where the temperature is zero. So obviously you will expect that with time everything, all the temperatures should go down to a temperature of zero. You agree? Okay. So if we would now plot, <coughs> okay, my left column and right column, let me, I'm just going to change it a bit, okay. So in terms of temperature, if we plot the temperature here as a function of time, and let's choose that t equals zero, okay. And we do exactly the same for this category of problem. Temperature as a function of time. And there is T equals zero. Okay. We start with the temperature at Ti. Okay. So at T equals zero, the temperatures, all of them should be there. Do you agree? Um, obviously, if there were no changes before t equals zero. Right. Now, I don't have enough colors here, but let's suppose we would use white for point one, we use yellow for point two, and as you can see, this is red, and there is <laughs> the third line. Okay. And here, exactly the same. All three of the lines are lined there on top of each other, because that represents the three different temperature measurements that I'm making. Right, now I would like to do this one first. Okay. So this one, if you would now monitor the temperatures, measure it, or solve it by CFD or whatever, then the temperatures is going to do uh, something like that, uh, the temperature of point 0.3, uh, maybe the temperatures of point 0.2 and the temperatures of point 0.1 and all of them with time would obviously go to zero degree Celsius. Something like that. That would be a typical response of, let me call it, the category 2 type of problem. Are you all with me in terms of my explanation? All right. Now let's look at category one. Category one, that is the temperature of point one, doing something like that. Okay. Temperature of point two.
doing the same. Temperature of 0.3, also the same. Okay. So these three lines, there are three lines. One, two, and three. The order doesn't matter. But for all practical purposes, they're on top of each other. Okay. So the obvious difference between a category one problem and a category two problem is this behavior. Do you agree? That is the difference. Why? Why will we have a category one type of problem doing that and then other categories of problems doing that? Okay, think about it for a, for a minute while I clean some board space and then we will discuss it after that. Ladies and gentlemen, okay, any, would any of you like to give me an explanation? Why do you think that is happening? Except now for the fact that the three lines are on top of each other. Why? <laughs> okay. Now the three lines on top of each other, this is called the lump system. A lump system. So when you've got this type of behavior, it's a lump system type of behavior. Category two are all the others. Okay. Now what are good examples of a lump system and others? Good examples of a lump system would be a small ball bearing. Made from stainless steel. A small ball bearing made from stainless steel would be a typical example of a lump system. Another type of system in the other category would be a big stake. big piece of meat, okay, or chicken, or turkey, or whatever, would have a lump system type of behavior. Okay. So, we can put them in these categories, and if you look in your textbook to look for that, to use these examples now to determine if something has a lump system approach or not, you'll see there's no such table. Okay. So the decision in terms of when a system is a lump system or not should be made on logic. Okay. So the decision should not be a table. This, the decision should be made on logic, on engineering judgment. Now coming back again to the resistances of bodies. Okay. If we have a body, and this is T environment, and just like there, we are interested to know in the body, okay, the temperatures of points 1, 2, and 3. Then what we can do is we can actually say, well, let's take that part of material. Let's say that is point two and that is point one. And we can actually subdivide this body into smaller elements. Do you agree? And for each one of them, there will be a resistance. So we will end up with a network of different resistance terms, which would obviously be, be very complicated. So you're going to end up maybe with a resistance term R3, 
and next to it is R2, uh, and somewhere they are connected, and then there's another one coming in here, and there's another one, and another one, and all of them later on, you know, something like that, and then later on you've got the convection one here on the outside. So any arbitrary body can be represented by these resistance terms. And there are typical examples of the resistance terms. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that complicated body can be represented as one conduction resistance term and one convection one. You agree? Right. Now what does resistance now really mean for us? Except now the fact that you've done it in electricity and you see this thing and you've got the ohms and you have to do the calculations. Resistance in terms of sort of developing a physical feeling for it would be, well, let's look at this type of problem where we've got a tube, a hose pipe, you know, which is being used in your garden to give water to the plants. Okay. And now you've got tennis balls. Okay. And you want to get it into a certain position. Okay. So if you now have to push all these balls through here, this is going to be a lot of resistance. Do you agree? It's going to be a lot of work trying to get it through. 60 millimeter tennis ball through a 20 millimeter tube, all of them one after the other. At the moment it is in here, what is going to happen in this case? It's going to say pop. Okay. From there to move it to any other position is very, very easy. And that is what resistance at the end of the day means. So when we, have, when we look at problems like this, we shouldn't only just go mathematically and go and calculate the resistance values. You must try to think for yourself, what does it really mean? Okay. So, again, if we now look at this, and this, to represent this, we must actually say, well, for this specific case, we've got a very small resistance here, and a large resistance there. Do you agree? So, if this is our conduction, and that is a convection heat transfer, then the resistance heat transfer in this case is much smaller than that of conduction. Okay, so this is the first type of possible scenario. The second type of possible scenario is the opposite. Okay. Here we've got all the tennis balls and we want to push it through to this volume on this side. What is going to happen now? Our resistance of getting it here is going to be easy, but then we have to push it through here. So that resistance is very, very high. Okay. So in this case, the conduction resistance would be much higher than that of convection. So that is the second type of scenario that we can have with different types of resistance terms. Okay, and the third type would be where we've got a hose pipe and about another one of almost the same diameter, but still there are the tennis balls and we have to get it through both of these hose pipes. So in this case, the resistance for conduction and the resistance for convection is of the same magnitude. There's not a big difference between the two. Now in terms of these possibilities of conduction, let's just go back again to 
and unfortunately I've started deleting it, the case of the plain wall. So for the plain wall, we've said that the conduction resistance is equal to L divided by Ka. And the one for the cylinder is equal to the lin of R2 divided by R1 divided by 2 pi LK. You can call, call it R2 divided by R1 or R outside divided by R inside, it doesn't matter. The one for the sphere is equal to R2 minus R1 divided by 4 times pi divided by R1 R2 divided by K. And this is the resistance for, uh, for any other body, very, very complicated body. And what would drive the resistance? If we look at all these equations, what would really have a big influence on resistance? So try not to look at all the detail. Try to look at the orders of magnitudes of the stuff. Okay. Let's come back to these cases. Okay when we've got this type of property in terms of what we've done now with resistances and you've divided it like that and now you've got the tennis balls okay. so when you've got the tennis balls pushing it through which is your convection resistance if you want the type of behavior where the temperatures are lying on top of each other what does it mean? it means the resistance is very very low understand? Okay. So when we push the tennis ball through, it will pop to any place that we want. And it will always be, it's not extra work to get it to a specific place. So in all these cases, we have low resistance. Low resistance of the thermal conductivity of the body. That is what it in essence means. So this is the convection resistance, any body, any different type of body, to get it to the temperatures T1, T2 and T3, could be, if it's very, very easy, then it means that the temperature gradient on the inside would be negligible. There's no resistance on the inside of the body. And that is the big difference between the lumped system and the other systems. But again, that doesn't give us this decision in terms of logic but we are on our way okay so a low resistance how do we get a low resistance if we look at all the res resistance terms that we have here if we want to get low resistance for a play plain wall that should be small you agree if that is small then the resistance is small if that is high then the resistance would be small. What materials will have a high thermal conductivity? Copper, stainless steel, diamond is the one with the highest thermal conductivity. So all those materials would ensure that this resistance is relatively small. So if we look at all of them, okay, I'm going to come back to the area just now. Okay. So all of them actually is a ratio of length to thermal conductivity. Okay. Length to thermal conductivity. Okay. Now if you look at this one, you would say, but wait a minute, uh, this area is giving us problems. Okay. If we want this to be, to be very small, then that should be very, very large, the surface area. Okay. And that is very confusing to many people. Okay. 
Now the thing to remember is that with this resistance term of the conduction on this side with the convection we have one divided by the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area. So these two take care of themselves. Okay. So in general bodies with a low resistance bodies with a low resistance would be firstly small small bodies with high thermal conductivities high values of K so in general those types of bodies will ensure that we sort of already know if we should take the lump system or not but again now the problem is what is small and what is high <laughs> okay so that still gives us a little bit of problems So, in general, what we, actually, what we can say is the lump system approach okay. would give good results if if the length is small. Now, what do I mean with length? Length would mean, in this case, a dimension. Okay. So the length would typically be the radius, the thickness, etc. So small bodies, small things, would be our first indication that the lump system might give us good results. And then the second one is high thermal conductivity okay. but at the end of the day it is the ratio of conduction to convection the, resist, the ratio of that, of that resistance to that one that is going to be the determining factor Right, at last we are going to start now with the mathematics and move towards something that we can start quantifying. Quantifying. So, this is our body that we would like to consider. And take note, it's an arbitrary type of geometry. Not necessarily a sphere or a wall or anything like that. Any type of body, doesn't matter. Now this body has a mass M a volume V, take note, that is volume, not velocity, okay, volume, with a certain density, a certain CP, and a temperature TI. And the whole body is at the temperature TI, the initial temperature. This is the surface on the outside, the surface, and on the outside we've got environment with a heat transfer coefficient and at t equals zero t equals zero we have those conditions so before that the body was at that temperature at t equals zero we change it and now we want to know the heat transfer from the body so let's derive that. We're going to start by saying the heat transfer into the body the heat transfer into the body during the period DT. is going to be equal to the increase in energy the increase in energy during the period DT now it sounds very complicated
but let me see if I can explain to you what is happening. If we now look at this body, and usually in a course like heat transfer, we are interested in the heat transfer rate. Okay. The heat transfer rate, Q dot, with units, watts. Okay. The rate at which energy is being transferred. Okay. And in most heat transfer problems, usually the question would be determine the heat transfer rate. Okay. You'll end up with the answer in watts or kilowatts or megawatts. Or maybe that would be part of the problem. That would be given and you have to determine maybe the surface area or the temperatures. Okay. In transient heat transfer, it is a bit more difficult. Why? Because if this body is at a higher temperature than that one, maybe water at zero, then in the beginning, the, heat, the temperature difference is large, but the temperature difference is going to decrease. So the heat transfer rate is going to do something like that. It's going to decrease. Do you, remember, do you agree with time? So if somebody gives you a problem like that and asks you to determine the heat transfer rate, then you can only answer him if you ask him, well, when? After one second, two seconds, or three seconds. Okay. So because we have that problem, as you know, we as engineers say, well, what we also can do is we can integrate that, very fancy, which means if I just look at that, it would be approximately that average value. You agree? Okay. So, to get that, the total watts, uh, the total joules, it would be the heat transfer rate multiplied by delta T. So this is delta T. So if I would integrate that, that would be watts per second, uh, uh, joules per second, sorry, joules per second, after a certain number of seconds, so the answer would be in joules. Okay. So what we're talking of here is the heat transfer into the body, or out of the body, in joules. Okay. How much energy is going out? Not the heat transfer rate, right, but this one. So that is what we're talking of there. So we know that the heat transfer rate can be written as the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area multiplied by T environment minus the temperature T. Okay, and the temperature T now is not a constant. It is changing every second. Do you agree? Okay. Okay, so that would be the heat transfer rate. Q dot in watts or kilowatts. But in this case, it is over a period of dt. So that now gives us this term. How much energy is being transferred in joules? Okay. We'll continue with the next lecture. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.